thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, all good. Excellent. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for this invitation to speak alongside such a great collection of papers. Um, the research I'm presenting today builds on a research project that was started over a decade ago that explored the spatial evolution of London's outer suburbs over the past 150 years. And it was conducted in co collaboration with the team based at UCL, one of whom I believe is here with us today. Uh, hi, Sam, if you're still there. Uh, Sam, that should be Dr. Sam Griffiths. Um, now, while there is some truth in all the cliches about suburbs, which I'm, I'm going to be uh, uh, mentioning in a moment, I am going to try and dispel them today in this presentation, which illustrates that despite the common perception of the suburban periphery lacking a spatial logic of its own, that in fact, at least in the case of London, it has a clear structure that can be identified by careful spatial analysis. I will demonstrate how London suburbs belie the conception of sprawl, showing how their multiple centralities shape their potential for land use diversity over time. And I will end with conclusions regarding the ecology of land use diversity that can support industrial and productive activities. And I'm going to argue that the discovery of industrial land uses present in suburbs of the past indicates an embedded potential for the urban periphery to support local work also in the future. The current convention is either antagonism towards the suburbs or a nostalgia for times past. And here we've seen flashing in front of us, first of all, my architectural uh, colleagues' perceptions of, of the suburbs uh, from the 1930s as a scum churning against the walls of the city. And on the other hand, we have this quote from, the king of, uh, from a letter written to the King of Persia about Babylon, uh, 539 BCE, which summarizes in many senses how many people think about suburbs and how suburbs are aspirational for many people around the world. So suburbs are not a recent innovation. This stone carving from the Persian city of Madaktu in the seventh century BCE shows suburban domiciles situated among the palm trees outside the city walls. And Peter Ackroyd has also commented of London suburbs that they are as old as the city itself. And discourse and concerns about urban sprawl can be found as early as the 16th century when Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth I passed an act of parliament to limit London's growth. In addition to setting up a three mile green belt around London and Westminster, the act also prohibited the creation of houses of multiple occupancy. To some, it has been seen as a very far seeing town planning idea, although the famous writer about London Rasmussen argued that it was more a response to fears of epidemic spreading due to the high density dwelling at the gates of the city, namely a form of housing hygiene, a very pertinent subject for us today, obviously. And this painting by a constable of London from suburban Hampstead in the 19th century highlights two essential concepts that I will return to. The first concept is that of um, path dependency. We have the same street section or this street alignment that had on the one hand, on one side of the street, a tea garden that then became a gin palace. And on the other side of the street, Steele's Cottage, which became a pub on the west um, uh, of the street. And this path dependency, what I'm referring to here is the fact we have the same sort of uh, land use there today, even though the relationship between Hampstead as what was then a suburb of the city has changed. Hampstead is now very much considered part of the urban conurbation that is called London. So I'm also stating that suburbanity is a concept that is spatially relational and temporal. Suburb today, urban tomorrow. And if we take the UK, for example, the view of the city edges as tabula rasa, and this in fact is an idea that, that, that Sam himself has written about. Um, if we view the, the, the city edges as tabula rasa beyond a clearly defined urban edge, this is a persistent concept that requires closer scrutiny to get a better sense of how cities and suburbs interconnect in a multi multitude of important ways. So do we have a hard edge beyond which is this sort of white area that is the area beyond, or do we have a much more interconnected system 
uh, as we've seen in some of the examples today. So the first section of my presentation is going to discuss Professor Bill Hillier's proposition that space syntax analysis of the complexity of the urban network can reveal that there is an underlying structure which contributes to the environmental, economic and social sustainability of cities. He refers to a concept of pervasive centrality, whereby the function of centrality pervades the urban grid in an intricate fashion, creating spatial differentiation and maintaining interaccessibility rather than strict boundaries between areas. Space syntax is a theory as well as a mode of network analysis that considers the street network as a configuration, namely a system of relationships between street alignments within set distances, measuring their relative connectivity and taking account also of angular change. So the display that you have in front of you here shows the mathematical analysis that we do in space syntax translated into a color scale where red is high accessibility through the temperature range to, to blue for spatial segregation. And this analysis of the section of London uh, uh, coming towards the center of London, you can probably see the Thames running through, demonstrates a strong correspondence between the location of shopping streets and, towns and local town centers where the network analysis is predicting high levels of local pedestrian movement. Now, while this analysis predicts linear retail, town centers in fact are not just made up of shops and have a wider role to play in providing other commercial activities, as well as offices, places of production, health, schooling, and other, communities, uh, other community functions. So let's try to throw some further light on, on these various forms of uh, spatial centrality. Here is a satellite photograph of, of a part of Northwest London, and it looks quite undifferentiated in this sort of image. If we then throw a space syntax analysis on top of it, as we do here, you can see that an analysis of local centrality, again, ranging from red through to blue, shows that same network analyzed showing a high level of differentiation that highlights again, local town centers, which many of which in the past would have been uh, villages in, out, in the outskirts of London at that time. And the same applies if I zoom into a different part of London, here just north of the West End, the commercial district of London. And here we can see emerging the local centrality of Marlebone High Street, revealed as having a powerful local potential for through movement at a range of around a kilometre or a kilometre and a half. And another example, this one not too far away from UCL's main campus, analysed with space syntax, revealing a very local street called Lambs Conduit Street, a highly successful local high street that serves its immediate surroundings and includes residential, office, as well as hospital functions. Uh, not right on the street, but just nearby. And lastly, the centuries old Leadenhall Market in the ancient city of London. So what we are seeing and what we are arguing that there is a continuity of built environment street networks over time that we can be, uh, if we analyze that using this form of analysis, we can start to reveal how spatial structures persist in time. And our research indeed shows that the evolution of London street networks over a century and a half reveals the ability of local centers to withstand change that corresponds to multiple spatial centralities of the street networks that are persisting over time. I'll say that again in, in simpler uh, terms. What I'm going to be showing you now is how a study of London's outer suburbs and their, their evolution over time reveals how and why they continue to be um, uh, active and vibrant centres today in different degrees of success, I should say. So stepping beyond the suburban cliche, here we are coming to one of the uh, four case studies that we looked at in a high level of detail. This is Surbiton in the southwest of London. And what we are doing here is starting to unpack one of the common criticisms, criticisms of, lot of um, uh, suburbs that they are characterized by sprawl. Sprawl is a pejorative term that does not really take us very far. As Garou has pointed out, the edge city may produce local centralities over time, at which point they stop being sprawl. Yet extremes of dispersal and concentration of populations are both difficult 
in um, providing a challenge to enabling these adaptations of the network. So we need to study how different uh, areas of the network evolve over time to see why some succeed more and some less so. And here, looking at this example of uh, Surbiton that uh, developed in the late 19th century as a railway suburb in southwest London, we can see that even when measured in relation to London in, in its entirety, some of its principal streets form important wide scale connections, remembering that the streets are coloured in a range from red uh, through to blue from uh, most connected to least connected. And here we have the town centre itself. And looking at the same area, but at a different scale of analysis, we're looking at through movement potential at the local scale. And here, um, many more of the, of the streets are revealed as having important connections to the immediate, immediate uh, environs of the town centre. And this brings us to the interesting case of South Norwood, which we, we, which we studied along with uh, Sabaton and two other cases. Uh, in order to see how its centrality evolved over time alongside its shifting patterns of land use uh, diversity, which is the, same, the next thing that I'm going to be showing you uh, today. So one of the principal sources of our data were the, the business directories of all the land uses within the reach of the town centres for four epochs. So four town centres um, capturing all of the data in a geographical information system to study their density, diversity and distribution uh, of different types over time. And all of that data uh, summarised for one of our cases for South Norwood in this uh, relatively straightforward histogram. And what we're seeing here is that the diversity of places such as Surbiton, which we saw a minute ago, or South Norwood in this instance, is much more constant over time than the cliche of a retail dominant local centre uh, would suggest. Although it is clear, of course, if we look at this particular example, that industrial uses have declined while retail land uses have become more dominant. And considering the network as it is today at different scales, we can see that different types of land uses serving different scales of local to wider scale customers are revealed as coinciding with different streets uh, that have different, if you like, powers within the center. In this instance, we can see a builder's merchant located on a street that is central for very local scales of movement. In the next example, we can see a hardware store located on a street that is central for slightly larger scale of local movement. And indeed, that street connects onwards to the local railway station. And lastly, in this example, a local theatre, which we'll see again uh, at the end of my presentation, is revealed as being central at a relatively larger scale of movement. And each of these scales have their own logic. You would want a theatre to be capturing an audience uh, wider beyond a local town centre. It is reliant on um, having connections beyond the immediate uh, centre itself. And in this uh, analysis, we can also consider land, the way in which land use diversity is supported in the way in which South Norwood's spatial structure evolved over time, the way in which it, it had infilling densification, but also maintaining its armature of wide scale connections throughout the past 140 years. And what we see in this um, uh, animation that I've just shown you is the evolution of um, the building footprints over time alongside the space and tax analysis of the same uh, four periods. And if you just look at this um, uh, rectangle here, that is highlighted in the next slide. So here we are looking at the town centre itself right at the centre of the map and we're just zooming in on a section just uh, to the south of it. And what we're looking at here is focusing on just one case, one of the buildings, the very interesting case of Wendy Hall, which was a residential building until H. Tinsley and Co. moved in in 1917, at which point they were already well established as scientific instrument makers that were listed uh, as being important, um, um, uh, an important industrial activity around the UK and beyond. The firm continued to be present in that, that location, just outside of the immediate uh, centre of the town, over the course of much of the 20th century. It's, uh, in the literature, it's referred to as having a craftsmanship and quality that were the hallmarks of the company's products. 
And this brings us, in fact, to the heart of the subject of peripheral centralities. Here we've got an industrial instrument maker being located in a peripheral suburb that at the time in 1917 was very much uh, on the outskirts of London. And it raises the question, why was it there and, and how did it uh, succeed to maintain itself there over a long period of time? If we look at the space syntax analysis of accessibility in South Norwood, taking account of the large area around the town centre, modelled here for network-wide choice, we find that although the firm itself, the company, was situated away from the accessible core of the town centre, which is where we see the warmest colours um, located here, it is still well within reach of the well-connected Portland Road, which is this street here, which connects very well into and outside of London. So if you couple to this the high rate of land use diversity situated within the area, a reasonably sized population, you can see that Mr Tinsley was able to call upon a good number of local workers. And in fact, historical evidence shows that Tinsley has provided employment for local people, both in the building itself, but also working from home. And the firm's location in this well-connected outer suburb afforded it access to resources within a wider ambit of the area. Indeed, Tinsley's was not the only industrial company that opened in the district. Stanley Halls and Trade School, which became the theatre that we saw earlier on, was founded by William Stanley, an inventor, inventor of the T-square, uh, a manufacturer and a, and a philanthropist. And there is evidence that new firms opened in the urban periphery in this way for, for many, many of the same similar reasons. Uh, there being room to expand on relatively cheap land, access to a relatively well-connected, um, a well-educated workforce and to well-connected street uh, system. And therefore it is not just the case for South Norwood. One of the earliest case studies that, that, that I, I've looked at is Boreham Wood, which was known for a time as the British Hollywood. And indeed today you have Sky Studios moving into it. Each of these areas had similar conditions situated in, in the case of Bournemouth, in the northern periphery, but situated in the periphery, benefiting from relatively cheaper land, access to the centre, but also access outwards to um, the uh, districts beyond to capture workforces that live outside of the capital. And today we find that many startup companies in Cambridge tend to be on the city's outskirts, probably following that same uh, spatial economic logic. And here we're turning to uh, the, the closing slides from my presentation. What we learned from our study of historical business directories of the outer suburbs is that live work arrangements were very common in the past. And yet recent shifts to working from home due to the pandemic point to the possibility that future productive uses might revert to taking place at or close to home. And this example that I'm showing you here from East London, uh, analyzed by my colleague, Dr. Ashley Danani, is a development that was constructed around 1900 to integrate several building types and uses with rows of connected workshops and multi-storey factory buildings alongside uh, residential uh, uh, dwellings just across the courtyard. And the project allowed for different combinations of use among the buildings with changes in the way that the use is connected to each other by shifting around that particular building morphology. And it is still in use in the same uh, broad, broadly generic uh, spatial logic with dwellings and workshops nowadays occupied by professional offices such as designers, uh, digitally based businesses and architects. So one of the many cliches regarding suburbs is that the high street is dependent on retail for its survival. In fact, a growing uh, a growing body of evidence is emerging that shows that town centres that are less reliant on retail are probably better able to weather fluctuations in the economy. And research by uh, uh, colleagues of ours has shown that it is the thick crust of workshops, offices, places of worship and small industry that can bolster the dozens of high streets around London. And having local employment also creates a positive feedback with the town centre, generating increased activity on the high street itself. Unfortunately, recent changes to planning laws here in the UK that allow for shops to be converted 
into residential use may cause irreversible damage to this uh, delicate ecology. And the suburbs themselves are transforming, becoming more densely built up over time. This long-term transformation of the periphery is exemplary of myriad other such examples within London's orbital, Royal, orbital road, the M25, which is actually creating a barrier to urbanization or if you like, to sprawl, which is where I end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, and absolutely amazing timing. So yeah, uh, you must have been practicing this one really good or you're just like a natural at this stuff. So thank you. <laughs> um, for me, it was interesting there looking at um, uh, the pictures from earlier on in your presentation there about Hampstead and kind of looking down into uh, down into London. Basically, I worked up there for a short period of time when I when I lived in London, and just being on that hill reminded me of the street that I, I actually used to work on at the top of the hill. Basically, so I, I was almost taken. I could visualize what that looks like today, as you showed me that old painting and stuff. So, um, and and again, just for me also. Uh, I'm aware of your space syntax, space syntax work, uh, but I, I've never really kind of got into it. So this is this is sparking my interest to kind of look at that granularity and, and kind of uh, uh, vitality that kind of happens down at, at that kind of micro scale. Although you're obviously looking at it in large scale as well, but bringing us down into that right down onto the street is really kind of fascinating. And uh, your last comments there about retail are really interesting, given that, uh, you know, the death of the high street is often being kind of, you know, uh, bandied all over the place, basically, uh, in the last two years, primarily because of COVID, but also a little bit before in, in certain parts of uh, the UK. So thank you very much for that. If you can stop sharing your screen, then I'll be able to see everybody else, hopefully, and then we can hopefully get some questions and comments. So um, over to the audience. Any questions, thoughts, comments, provocations? You know, we'll, we'll take anything, you know, to kind of round this out. You know, we, we should be, you know, finishing this one off with a bit of a bang, hopefully. Nicholas. Virtual hand. Nicholas virtual hand. Not him again. Um, yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is a bang to go out on. Uh, I doubt it very much, but really enjoyed that, uh, Laura. And uh, like Paul, I'm um, not, not totally familiar with the, the space syntax um, style of work, but a little bit familiar with it. And I sort of echo Paul's comment about, um, you know, the sort of visualizations and the, and the scales we typically tend to think of um, in planning and, and perhaps geography are are larger than the, the very micro scale um, but of course the micro scale is is really important along with all those other scales regional metropolitan even sort of intra metropolitan the sort of neighborhood scale so down right down to the street level is still you know really intriguing uh to, to think about these things i mean the other the, the other comment i was going to just make is uh liking the idea of the pervasiveness of centrality um i think that came out in one or two of the other talks as well um you know just just listening to oleg's uh talk for example about the periphery not seen as being marginal but as something to be centralized or had the potential to be centralized um i think we saw it in um gabrielle and and carola's talk on the pervasiveness of the of the military complex i suppose uh feeding in, in, in all kinds of ways into the production of the built environment and the peripheral uh, built environment so um, those are the two things that sort of resonated um with me um for sure um so no questions more more like just underlining a couple of uh really intriguing aspects of the talk i think yeah i think the um the the uh, case study that we saw from Rome as well, uh, the, this idea of shifting centrality is very much talks to to the way we think about the evolution <coughs> of places over time. I, I, it, it, considering considering places, and we've seen a lot of histories over the last couple of days. I think is really important because um, we tend to just label a place a suburb and then sort of think that that's the end of the story. But actually, we look at, if, if we look at it's past 
as well as how it has changed in recent times, I think that can be very informative. And, and that idea that, that we saw from Rome of, of, of that shifting centrality and perhaps the, the, the gravity um, uh, changing in that, that sense is, is quite important. You know, how do um, places on the periphery uh, uh, actually over time as they densify, as they, we, we would, in a shortcut, we would say as they urbanize actually start to have uh, a, a, a strength in their own right. Um, so I, I think that's important. And if I could also respond to Paul's comment about uh, about um, high streets. This, this, is, this is such an important uh, topic at the moment, and I'm sure not just in the UK. We've, a lot of people who've been working from home have discovered, oh, look, I've got shops down the road from me that I didn't know existed because I never really looked at them. Um, and it'd be interesting to see, I'm not in the business of forecasting, but I wonder whether, um, in fact, local high streets that, that have some sort of decent uh, spatial logic that, that they, they're part of people's routes to work will continue to maintain that, that uh, increased uh, vitality. Uh, we hope anyway, don't we? Yeah, uh, yeah look, uh, um, Laura, I think, um, sorry to butt in and kind of dominate the conversation, but um, yeah, that, that notion of suburban spaces urbanizing through interventions like uh, Todd's, for example, or the development of apartment complexes, which we associate with an urban with with urban environments. Um, and that's why I kind of use the term, I use the word suburban, I always put the sub in brackets, in a way, and I, I've started to kind of use uppercase and lowercase to denote whether one is more suburban, one's more ob urban, the kind of sh and it's really what I'm kind of showing is there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship going on here with these two spaces that we generally perceive to be urban, you know, which don't which don't have hard boundaries for me, but I think we generally do see them in some ways hard with hard boundaries. But they're they're in this really kind of um, you know uh, dynamic relationship with one another, and suburbia filters into the urban and, and, and into the core because most people who work in the core come from the suburbs of course you know so there's a suburban mentality there's a sur suburban population drift and a you know a suburbanality in you know but maybe a bad choice of word but infecting the the core in a way basically and then of course the core allows su suburbanites to behave badly because it's a space of anonymity risk and adventure because that's the way we kind of proceed you know, so there's so the suburbs aren't spaces of conformity because all these people are flowing in and out of them and stuff like this, basically. So, yeah. Um, and I, I liked, again, what you were saying there about, uh, and I think Rogier has this position in his book, Suburban Planet, rather than looking at the suburbs from the center out, it's about looking from the outside in, basically. And I suppose that's what I mean when I talk about suburban and, you know, in, in those different kind of contexts, I think.